come here and attend. And really, I think how we're going to begin, how this really originated, uh, it was probably around a year, maybe two years ago. And it was with Rocky Mountain Health Plan. And there were more disabled, handicapped people that were uh, coming in to uh, receive services. Um, and there may be, there were people who were phys with physical disabilities um, who were, who had come in and like Julie over here. And, So really, it's imperative today that we really relay how the health services impact people who are deaf and hard of hearing and people with disabilities in general. Because there has been difficulty receiving services in the past. And so we thought that we would go ahead and initiate a board so that we can provide this information to everyone in the medical community. So first of all, I would like to introduce the board members. That's Roy Halpern, first of all. Roy Halpern, would you please stand? Jana McCutcheon. Cynthia Montgomery. Sandy Smith. Jenny Miller. Sarah Burnett. Up front. Who else? Am I forgetting anyone? Nicole Conklin. I think that's everyone. Now there uh, is a gentleman, Mike Smith, who was on the board, but he was unable to attend uh, due to work. And so we will continue with that. So I guess right now I'll go ahead and address deaf culture. <coughs> and what is deaf culture? <coughs> that is a collective of deaf people. It's not, it's not like putting up a wall or a barrier in between deaf and hearing people. We're just looking at communication access and then communicate effective communication. And I think that we are part of the hearing community as well. So really, the two facets would be someone who is deaf or hard of hearing and then American Sign Language, if they use American Sign Language for communication, for their primary means of communication. So as you know, around our globe, we have a variety of cultures. And the interesting part is that here in America, we have cultures just here in our melting pot as well. Russia has its own. However, all over the globe, anyone that is deaf or hard of hearing from international from other countries, they have their own sign language. Okay. However, we are kind of one big culture. In each country, whenever a deaf person would meet another deaf person internationally, they would be able to communicate. And there's about 136 different languages across the globe, sign languages across the globe. And they are, it is not universal. And that's really the first thing that needs to be understood. 
And so America, American Sign Language is not recognized or is not used by other international um, cultures. So specifically kind of boiling down to healthcare, law enforcement, mental health field, and also employment. Really, those are the top four where we have noticed a communication breakdown, and we have faced that pretty frequently. However, we want to improve the communication as a whole. And so our question is, how do we improve communication? And we have different technology, which is going to assist with that. However, the number one for technology, we have the best technology of all, and that is sign language interpreters. Because we can use our phone through video relay interpreters. There's VRI, text-to-text <coughs> -text communication, and so, but it, it's not 100% effective. And a live interpreter is really the best mode of communication uh, for a deaf person. And so I'm just wondering here in the audience, uh, who is in the healthcare field? <coughs> so the majority. Now, do you have any questions right off hand for me? Why? Why is sign language the most effective? Because utilizing um, American Sign Language, we can understand each other. And it's not strictly with the hands. It, it also involves a lot of other features, expressions, body language, things of that nature. Here, let me see if I can give you an example. So let's take President Obama, for example, and um, Vladimir Putin from Russia. If we were to put them together into one room without an interpreter, do you think they would be able to understand each other? <laughs> Doubtful. So if there is a deaf person who's American and a deaf person who is Russian, there's different sign language as a whole, and do you think that they would be able to understand each other? And the truth is that there's a lot of variations within deaf culture, especially from America to um, Russia, and so they do have different languages, and they're very distinct. Is there another question? You had mentioned um, VSL as an option, and I'm not familiar with what that is. Could you explain that? That's VRI. Oh, VRI, excuse me. That, that's called video relay interpreting. There's a screen that's pulled in, like if you have a deaf patient that comes into the doctor's office, there's a screen that's pulled in. <clears throat> and they, they use the hospital or the facility's internet connection in order to have uh, an interpreter come up on the screen to provide interpreting services. Any other questions? Like that. 
privacy of the law is still in effect, the law of privacy. So if you have an interpreter that comes in, they have to abide um, with HIPAA laws. And so confidentiality is imperative. And so they would not, the interpreter would not be able to leave the office and then go tell other people what happened that day uh, for their job. And I have worked in the medical field before um, as a vet. And so I understand the confidentiality on both sides. And so I do understand how you, uh, your perspective on that. Any other questions? I have another one. <coughs> I've heard that deaf people don't consider themselves disabled. Is that true? And if so, why? We do not consider ourselves disabled. Really, we just can't hear. But we can do everything else. I think another uh, um, example is Sandy's husband. He drives a semi truck and he is in actually in California right now. And I work graveyards. And I'm on a freight team. And working now, I'm actually uh, in line to be promoted at my job. There's another deaf person who's a psychologist. Roy, for example, he will be a, a master electrician. I would say our reading level, I would say 98%, I don't know, 98%, but maybe 80, 85%, uh, you know, we, you do not need to be able to hear in order to do your job. My name is Julie Riskin, and I'm with the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition, or Disability Rights Organization, and I've been facilitating this amazing group of people that put this event together. And they, they're, they call themselves Bridging Communication because they really want to bridge the communication gaps between the deaf and the hearing community particularly in healthcare. Um, after this panel, you'll get an explanation of what is in your toolkit. And those toolkits are really made so that you can go back to your offices, whether they're human services or medical offices, and implement what is best practice. Um, so on this panel, and I'm going to ask people to introduce themselves as I'm asking questions. Um, instead of having everyone just kind of go in a row, we have a in, in kind of an order. But um, on the panel, we have legal experts, we have people that are in the healthcare field, when we have experts on the deaf and hard of hearing communities. Um, and so, and we also are going to hear from an interpreter coordinator to kind of understand the backside of how that all works. How, how, do, how do you make it happen that these interpreters appear and do this? Um, but, uh, let's start, um, I'm going to start by asking um, Andrew Montoya, who is an attorney, uh, a disability rights attorney also with the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition, to give us an overview of what, what the law says, what, what do people have to do, and when we talk about the law, we're talking primarily about the Americans with Disabilities Act, although there are some other laws that, that follow in place, but we'll start that off with a framework so people understand really what it is that, that people must do. Um, Andrew. Thank you, Julie. Um, to give a brief introduction, I'm Andrew Montoya. I'm an attorney with the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. I've um, been doing this kind of work for about five years now, so I'm fairly familiar with uh, the ADA and some of the other disability rights laws. Um, as Julie alluded to, the ADA is going to be the primary law that we're going to be talking about when we're talking about providing sign language interpreters. The ADA, of course, is much broader, so please don't walk out of here thinking that you're ADA experts after this, uh, after this panel. Um, the ADA does deal with physical access, employment issues, um, even other communications access issues beyond that of our period individuals. Um, as you'll see from one of the handouts that I've prepared for you guys, 
Uh, auxiliary aids and services is a fairly broad term. That encompasses things like braille or readers for deaf individuals. It uh, can also um, require communication aids for people with, say, traumatic brain injuries or developmental disabilities. So even communication access is much broader than simply deaf access, but we're going to talk about deaf communication access um, mostly today. Under the ADA and another federal law, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, um, both of those laws are very similar, and in fact, the uh, uh, Section 504 predates the ADA by about 10 or 15 years. But at this point, essentially all of this incorporate the ADA standards. So regardless of which law you're talking about, we're going to be talking about the same ultimate point, which is effective communication. Both of these laws require effective communication for people with disabilities. So of course you're asking what does effective communication mean? It's a you know, great legal concept. And the Department of Justice has essentially defined effective communication to be communication that is effective as communication with other non-disabled individuals. That's, uh, that's not really a bright line, but I think as you'll uh, discuss things with the other panel members today, you'll find that the line becomes a little bit brighter and a little clearer, and of course if you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask. I'm sure everyone on this panel will be more than happy to answer questions. So how do you get to effective communication? Well, again, the law is clear. You've got to provide auxiliary aids and services. In most situations, that's going to be a sign language interpreter, particularly when you're talking about a medical, uh, medical communication. It does, however, include things such as writing and back and forth. Um, that other sorts of communication it could include uh, your own reporting as well. But again, the end point of what the law requires is going to be effective communication. Great. Um, Candace, you're with the Commission of the Colorado Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Can you talk about issues affecting people that are hard of hearing also and briefly introduce yourself and what the commission does? Yes, hello, I'm Candace Alder, and I do work with CCDHH, the Colorado Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Prior to that, I worked for the ADA Center in Colorado Springs. I am certified regarding the Americans with Disabilities Act. So I am very familiar and uh, can approach this from both perspectives. I identify myself as hard of hearing. I have Meniere's disease, and that is affecting me in both of my ears. I actually lost my ability to hear later in life, and American Sign Language is my second language. English is my first language. So, I can communicate with individuals in a variety of different ways. The Commission focuses on communication access for all individuals. One thing that we often think of is that, that means interpreting services, and that that provides deaf people their needs. But really, I also want you to all remember that um, interpreting is not just for the deaf individual. It is for everyone in that communication situation. So the uh, deaf individual needs to communicate their needs to the doctor or the medical provider, etc. Absolutely. But then the doctor or medical provider needs to get all of that information and then needs how to provide information back to that individual. They'll be figuring out what is the best manner of services for that deaf individual. So remember, the interpreter is not solely for the deaf person. It's for everyone who is trying to communicate effectively. Communication access is really the key barrier for deaf and hard of hearing people. Most of the time, it's easy to provide communication access, but so often people become paralyzed and they're kind of frozen with the concept of not having a clue how, where to begin, how to provide communication access. So then they think, well, okay, maybe it's simple. We could just write notes back and forth. But for so many deaf individuals, American Sign Language is their first language. And English is not. 
So when you choose to communicate with those individuals through written English, it can be a struggle. It can be very awkward. Another barrier that uh, medical professionals often face and deaf individuals going to those professionals is that they think there's a one size fits all. Um, you know, they think, well, for example, I personally would prefer to have heart services rather than a sign language interpreter at my medical appointments. And just to give you an idea of what that looks like, it's kind of like a court reporter, but then that person types out everything that is spoken in English and I can read it in English, which is my first language. Um, I, I, however, deaf individuals who are predominantly users of American Sign Language uh, will make another choice. But I, I give you this example because you need to understand that deaf and hard of hearing will have, people will have varied needs. We all vary significantly in terms of our communication preferences, and so you need to be flexible with the approaches that you use for providing communication access. It also depends on the type of health care. So it affects the different titles within the Americans with Disabilities Act and which of those titles apply to your center. So for example, if you have a state-run program for health care, the rules are different than if you are in practice, a private practice. So what that means then is that there are situations where you actually need to follow the preference of the individual uh, at the state level. A person in private practice, you may have some financial limitations and uh, the way to address that and to uh, ultimately navigate the needs for providing effective communication is a little bit different. Am I answering your question, Julie? Yeah, that very much, thank you. Um, we have two, um, physicians here and, um, and also someone who works on the front office. So one of the things that people often think is, well, how, how, do I, how do I do this? And it's scary when you're looking at providing services to someone who doesn't speak your language and you're not quite sure what to do. So I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves, um, starting with uh, Dr. Lennox, and, and tell us what you do and how it was for you to start working with, with deaf people, and also, was it harder or easier than you thought? And then I'm gonna ask you over there the same question. All right, um, my name's Dr. Jared Lennox. I'm a dentist at the Health District of Northern Larimer County Family Dental Clinic. Um, I've been practicing there just over a year now. So, um, one thing I was really thinking about before I was gonna talk here was, um, the type of appointments we see at the health district. And a lot of the times we see patients who come in that are in a lot of pain, um, and they come in for an emergency exam um, with a badly decayed tooth or an infection. And a lot of times, the minute they walk in that door, we know that they're in a lot of pain. You know, they're holding their face, you can see they're swollen, um, and we don't even have to say one word to, to them to know that right away. Um, but when someone comes in in that much pain, we also know that there's gonna be a difficult time communicating with that person, even if they can hear us. Um, so when I see patients who are deaf and they're in pain, I first thought it was going to be that much more difficult. Um, you know, they're hurting, they're gonna have a hard time describing their symptoms to me, how am I gonna do this? And at the health district, we want to make sure that we're providing our patients the best possible care that we can. And one way we can do that is by making sure that we're communicating with them efficiently and effectively. Um, so the minute they walk in that door, and if they have a live sign language interpreter there with them, I already know that that patient's going to be that much more at ease um, without having that communication barrier there. Um, being able to talk to our healthcare team from the front desk, passing it on to the uh, dental assistant, um, and finally to the doctor. Um, just having that interpreter there is very important. And it made that experience a very rewarding one for me, and um, pretty efficient actually too. I was really surprised by how, how easy things went. Um, so overall, I would say that 
I was surprised by how how easy it went, and um, it, it was a good experience. So. Uh, Dr. Rupp, can you introduce yourself and tell us about your experience? Hi, I'm Dr. Leith Rupp. I'm also with the Health District of Northern Larimer County. Uh, I've been working there for a little while. Um, Jared's one of my colleagues there. Um, I've had very good experiences with the interpretive services um, for people that speak sign language. Um, I think I'd like to piggyback on what Jared said. Most of the time, uh, people that come in there, the patients that come in there, they're in a lot of pain with serious uh, mental problems. Um, through that, I've actually been able to develop some relationships with patients to where they don't just come in now for serious health problems, infections, and things like that. They can come in for all of their dental care. And I think that using the interpretive services has really helped with that. Um, helps me as the doctor and the patient feel like we have a medium there so we can communicate with each other. And that's been really effective um, to develop relationships, but then to, to, to see regular dental care there, and not just emergencies. Um, I think it's been really rewarding uh, to develop those relationships. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come back to you in a minute, um, Chris, and ask you about how it, how it works. But I'd like to ask Sarah to, talk, to tell us what she does and to talk about how, how, do you, how does one get an interpreter? How, how do these people appear and do this? So I get a cheat. I'm sharing my answer with Jenny Miller sitting right next to me. Um, my name is Sarah Burnett, and I work for a nonprofit agency that also has an interpreter referral part of it. Um, basically, the most important part is to call an agency, right? So there are several different agencies to choose from, really a lot of agencies. So the basic parts about agencies is there are going to be a last minute request. Let me back up. When you request, the best thing to do is to give as much time as possible for the agency to schedule someone. The closer it gets to that appointment, and of course life happens, there's lots of emergencies or last minute stuff that comes up. The closer it gets to that appointment time, there often is a charge, an increased charge for having to schedule someone. So it's a lot easier to get us that information as soon as possible. Um, there are travel and mileage costs, depending on which agency you choose. They might have one or both. Um, there might be a one hour minimum or a two hour minimum. Um, there are cancellation policies as well. So let's say, you know, the patient gets sick and they can't come in for a dental appointment, something like that. So they don't want to get anyone else sick. And if there's a something that happens like that, if you guys cancel within less than 24 or 48 hours, whatever the agency sets up, the agency will still charge for the service just because life happens so often. And so if, if that weren't the case, we wouldn't be able to, to make any money either. So, um, and actually I feel like that's a lot of doctor's offices I'm, I'm aware are doing the same thing. If there's a less than 24 hour cancellation, then the doctor's office will still charge for services. Um, one of the things that really helps me as an interpreter is to know that I'm part of the care team. So you guys can share the patient's name and share information that's gonna help us so we don't walk in and we're completely blindsided by something that we couldn't expect. So if you're interested about that part of it, you can find it on hhs.gov. Um, it does have information about how you can explain to people if they need to know um, that you're not breaking confidentiality, anything like that. The reason why it's important for us to have the patient's name is, first of all, we want to be able to match their language as best as possible. Not every person, like Candace was explaining, uses language the same way if they're deaf or hard of hearing. And that's true with sign language as well. There is a spectrum of, of where they might fit, and we want to do the best job possible for them. The other part of that is there might be, the, the deaf community is pretty small, so I don't want to accidentally schedule someone that might be a relative or a close friend, and they show up, you know, and they're like, oh, I didn't know you were going to be here. You know, that could cause problems. Um, so that also will protect the patient's information as well. Um, really, I'm trying to keep it pretty brief because I could really talk a long time. 
I really enjoy this stuff. There's the info. I, I know a lot of agencies have um, really great websites that have all the information that they're needing online. So the stuff that I would need is who is the appointment for, what is the appointment for, if if it's a dental appointment versus possibly an OBGYN appointment, that could really impact if I'm going to send a male interpreter versus a female interpreter, obviously. Um, how long the appointment is going to last. This is something that it's good to schedule maybe an extra 15 minutes the first time to see what possibly the process will take for your specific office. It takes a little bit longer for the interpretation process sometimes, <coughs> so you want to make sure that everyone's on the right schedule. So that's helpful. Often interpreters are so busy right now that they're back to back. And so what happens is if they're at that time limit, they have to leave and go to the next appointment. And you guys might be still in the middle of something. And that gets really hard. that I would want to emphasize that I, I don't want to take up too much time if that's okay. What I'd like to do is send out an email. And in this email, because you guys all registered with us, what I would include is um, how to use an interpreter. We also have a code of professional conduct that we take very seriously. On uh, The top of the list is confidentiality. And so I'd, I'd want to provide that for you so you all know what is appropriate for interpreter behavior and what's not. Um, I'd also want to include there are Colorado has specific laws related to who is qualified, what a certified interpreter looks like, and you know someone who doesn't have a certification. And so it, that's something that, that I feel is very valuable information as well. Um, so what I'd like to do, if you guys have any other questions, my information is on the pamphlets that are on the front desk, um, and I will send out those emails to everyone that's registered. And if there are any questions, you can come and talk to me or email me or anything like that. The actual process of interpreting, I'm going to leave to Miss Jen Miller because she just did such a great job explaining it to me earlier. And I thought she did a better job than I would have. So. And I, I just wanted to let everyone know that there will be, a, after the formal part is finished, all of the panelists will be sitting at tables. And while you guys eat cookies, you can go talk to people if you have private questions that you want to ask any of these panelists. Um, that you don't want to ask in a group. I forgot to say that earlier. So, sorry. Go ahead. That's great. Um, so, what I'm going to talk about a little bit more. I'm going to introduce myself, and then I'll talk about um, some of the process of getting a sign language interpreter. Um, my name is Jenny Miller, and I'm the specialist for the deaf and hard of hearing at Disabled Resource Services. Disabled Resource Services is one of ten centers for independent living around the state of Colorado. There's independent living centers all around the United States, but Disabled Resource Services serves all of Larimer and Jackson counties. Um, I gave a presentation previously um, to a bunch of uh, high school kids to tell them about, oh, when they move on, to try and find a center for independent living near them. And how I explained it was, for example, here, Front Range Community College and CSU help with the education piece, and so that's where you would go to go to college. The Department of Vocational Rehabilitation is for the work piece. If you want to get a job, they uh, help give services for people that have disabilities to help them succeed in finding employment. And a center for independent living is the community piece. So um, we help with getting um, items that for deaf and hard of hearing. We, um, uh, hearing aids um, is a different story altogether <laughs> because that is just so expensive. There is something called a hearing aid bank here, but it just depends on the county. Um, we help with um, applications. Uh, we help with uh, navigating community resources. So um, just wanted to give you the heads up that um, that's what we do. We have um, uh, Taryn and Karen from Disabled uh, Resource Services in the back, and so you can talk to them. Um, and also, they have something on the table called pocket talkers. 
I don't know if any of you would benefit from a pocket talker right now. It's to amplify the earpiece. So if you would benefit from that, um, you can talk to them. So anyway, so if a deaf person comes um, knocking on your door saying if they need an appointment, um, what the best thing to do is to call an interpreting agency. And uh, the interpreting agency will ask you um, questions uh, you know the logistical information about you know the consumer, the address, uh, where the interpreter needs to go, that sort of thing. What type of appointment it is, and also they'll give you billing information. And I think we'll um, have another person talk about some of the billing information soon. But um, <coughs> then the interpreter shows up and facilitates communication. Usually, the um, interpreter is closer to the um, English-speaking person. So they can see, um, so the deaf consumer can see um, both the doctor or um, whoever they're going to see, as well as the interpreter. So they can gauge um, the facial expressions, the body movement, the um, sort of question that you guys are asking. Um, then um, after that, the appointment's over, and then the uh, front desk people get in touch with your billing people and then they send the invoice and that sort of information is there. Oh, and I do have one thing I have done, but is there anything else about the interpreting process that I'm missing that you'd like to add, Sarah? Not at the moment. Okay, and then I want to bug Candace for a second, if I could. Bring the microphone to I wonder, Candace, would you mind um, discussing why um, there is a need for deaf interpreters? I don't know if you all noticed that we have um, three amazing certified hearing <coughs> interpreters here, as well as two amazing certified deaf interpreters here. And um, we did that on purpose for this event, just to give you guys a flavor of what that looks like. But I didn't know, um, not to put you on the spot, Candace, but would you mind um, discussing a little bit what the reason for deaf interpreters are? Certainly. I can do that. Wow, like I mentioned earlier, there are so many options in order to meet communication needs. A person who maybe is fluent in American Sign Language and that is their first language, the truth is, is that American Sign Language has its own grammar, its own syntax, its own structure and rules, and there are a variety of methods in which some individuals don't fully acquire English or other languages. It might be from their education, it might be that they are a, a native signer, um, maybe they had more exposure to American Sign Language and that's really the primary communication need. But there are other deaf individuals who really need that first hands-on experience of having a native signer provide the communication access and that is the benefit of using an interpreter who is themselves deaf. Another situation that could occur as well is that you may have someone who has moved here from another country and they use a different signing system. Their country has a different sign language. So when they move here to the United States, they may not know American Sign Language at all. They may be picking some signs up, but particularly when you're looking at a medical circumstance, you will want to bring in a deaf interpreter <coughs> along with a hearing interpreter as a team to provide communication access for that person coming into your office. That provides, well, a bridging of the gap in communication. Also, if you have a person uh, who perhaps uh, their parents were hearing, and actually that is true for most deaf individuals, their parents are hearing, but under those circumstances, the parents may have made a decision to educate their child in the mainstream. And they, in school, may have not learned English fluently. It may not have been something they acquired well. And so it could very well be that um, they've even been deprived completely of language. In those instances, 
Interpreters are knowledgeable in knowing how to interact with those individuals. Best if it's a deaf interpreter because they intuitively have a way of figuring out how to communicate with an individual who lacks any language whatsoever. And that's another circumstance when a deaf interpreter is best provided. Um, another environment in which uh, a deaf interpreter is uh, very beneficial is in mental health circumstances. That is also beneficial. Have I answered your question, Jen? So now, Chris, I'd like you to talk about, so there's, uh, you're at the doctor's office and you're the person that they see when, when someone first comes or calls or asks for an appointment. How do you handle it? What do you do when someone asks for it, when someone has a communication issue? Hi, I'm Chris. I work at the Health District Family Dental Clinic. Um, I have actually spoken and helped a lot of patients with a lot of different circumstances and a lot of different um, interpretation um, skills. Um, I have helped a lot of patients who have used the phone services. I think that's called TTY. Um, we've had folks who come in with their own interpreters. Uh, we've had folks who come in and have written notes back and forth. And um, we've had folks who've come in, written notes, and then we've called um, our friend Sarah or emailed her and had an interpreter set up so that we would be prepared for them with their first intake appointment and their first um, dental appointments and all the follow-up appointments after that. Um, we, of course, handle it on a one-on-one -on -one individual basis. Um, and I think our best rule of thumb is to take our time. Um, writing notes back and forth can take quite a while, but it works. It gets the job done. Um, and when we email Sarah, um, she gets all the information like she said she does. She needs to know who the patient is, what they're coming in for, how long the appointment is, um, perhaps who the doctor is that they'll be seeing is really helpful. Um, and that helps her to prepare on her end so that her company is best prepared to help everybody on our end. Um, we, like I said, we normally email her to set everything up. Um, and she, we, and we also, I have to back up a little bit, we normally contact her 48 hours in advance of the appointment to make sure that we are absolutely lined out and we have everything ready to go. Um, and that way, if we know the patient is not coming in, <coughs> we can free up her interpreter to be able to help somebody else. <coughs> um, and we've also learned the hard way that if the patient doesn't show up, uh, there's a cost involved for that with us, and we don't mind that. That's perfectly fine because life happens. Um, her interpreters normally come in probably I would say at least 15 minutes before the patient does so that the interpreter's there and ready to greet them when they come in. They sit and talk with each other. They might know each other, they might not. Um, but that way they have a little rapport when they go back to the doctor's office. And we always make sure that those appointments, the time of the appointment is actually extended quite a bit so that the doctor has all the time that they need to help that patient and make sure that that communication is flowing both ways and that everybody is learning all the things that they need to do and everything can be accomplished. Thank you. It, giving, giving that extra time is, is what the legal people call a reasonable modification of policy and it's required under the Americans with Disabilities Act so it's good to hear that you're doing that naturally. Um, but that's, that's exactly the kind of thing that the Americans with Disabilities Act says. This is how you avoid discrimination, is you modify policies in that way. So it's one thing when you have a front office person like Chris and, and who knows exactly what to do and has experience, but sometimes you don't, or sometimes things might not be working, or you feel there's a, a miscommunication, and you just feel like communication is breaking down and you're not really connecting with your patient. So Julie, I'd like you to talk about how, what, what you do and how you guys can help in those situations. Hi, my name 
My name is Julie Sholley, and I'm a care coordinator with Rocky Mountain Health Plans. Um, care coordination is an additional service that's available to those who receive Medicaid and are enrolled in the ACC, or the uh, Accountable Collaborative, uh, Accountable Care Collaborative. That's a mouthful, so we just say the ACC. Um, but basically, a care coordinator is a person that is designated to help an individual navigate and understand the variety of <coughs> services, medical and social services within the community. So I can see where a care coordinator could be um, a helpful link, a bridge in this process. Um, perhaps a member has established a new doctor and they're scheduling their first doctor's appointment. Um, it could be that the care coordinator could uh, make that call to the doctor's office, let them know that the person is hearing impaired and, and will need an interpreter, and to help ensure that those services are available when that appointment occurs. Um, there's a lot of other services that we can provide too, um, uh, but maybe, uh, maybe that just answers your specific question for now. Thanks. Um, Andrew, I'm going to come back to you, and I'd like you to, to talk about what, uh, two, I'd like you to address two things. One is, what is best practice? We, you talked about what the law says you have to do. I'm assuming the kind of people who come here want to do the best that they can for the patient, not the bare minimum required by law. So if you can talk about what's really best practice when working with the, the deaf and hard of hearing communities. And within that, if you could also, and I'm going to ask a few other panelists to weigh in on this after you do, talk about when we, uh, Patrick mentioned VRI earlier, and talk about when that is and when it is not appropriate. There's a really good handout that Candace provided that's in people's packets, but I'd like you to kind of address those two things together, because that's, that's an area that comes out, um, that, that seems to be brought up a lot. All right, thank you. So, I, I would absolutely say the best practice would be that if someone deaf or hard hearing comes into your uh, medical establishment, Seeking services, talk to the person. Find out what the person prefers as their choice of accommodation. Um, maybe that some person, uh, some people prefer a live sign language interpreter. It may be that some people prefer to use written notes or card services. So it sounds absolutely common sense, but I would just encourage you to talk to the person. <coughs> That's going to be your first uh, first way of doing things. Um, to kind of go back to one of the things that Candace had mentioned earlier about whether, uh, whether you have to provide an interpreter, and she touched on the different titles of the ADA, um, just to kind of clear up some of that. So there, there are two titles of the ADA that would really apply to the providers. Title II, which would be any sort of government agency, so that would also include um, medical clinics who are uh, you know, county agencies, things like that. Uh, Title III deals with places of public accommodation. So that would be essentially any other doctor's office that, uh, that is not associated with a county or state, uh, state office. Um, agencies that are associated with a county or local government have to, provide, uh, have to give primary consideration to the specific requests of the person with a disability. So let's say that a person who is deaf or hard of hearing comes in and says, I need a sign language interpreter live, yet you guys have it. A, a cart machine sitting right there, or a VRI machine sitting right there. You still have to give preference to that individual's expressed uh, expressed um, auxiliary or service. The obligation is a little bit lesser if you are not a, a uh, county or a local government um, associated clinic, but the end point again would be effective communication. If you refuse to provide that live sign language interpreter saying that the law doesn't require you to give primary consideration, which we have encountered in some situations, you still have an obligation to provide effective communication. And if that video or interpreting machine is not going to work, then you have not provided effective communication and you probably violated the law. So again, I, I would absolutely encourage you, as your very first thing, talk to the person, find out what the person they want. Um, kind of going hand in hand with that is affirmatively offer a sign language interpreter um, there are some deaf and hard of hearing individuals who don't know that they have a right to request a sign language interpreter. But if you take that affirmative step and make the offer, that person is one, going to probably patronize your clinic or, or a medical establishment a lot more than any others if they have a choice. 
But two, that person's going to be a lot more at ease with uh, your staff and with the doctor, and essentially the, the provision of care. Um, I would uh, absolutely encourage you all, to the extent that you are doing any sort of medical procedure, to make sure that you hire a medically certified interpreter. As someone had mentioned earlier, in Colorado, there is a law that requires sign language interpreters to be certified. Um, essentially what that says is that it is a deceptive trade practice for someone to hold themselves out as a sign language interpreter, interpreter for the deaf. There's a slew of other words and phrases included in that. Unless that individual holds a, a, an active and valid certification from the Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf. And that interpreter has also got to be able to show the consumer his or her membership card that says that it's valid. If that person cannot do so, then either that person has or your office has committed a deceptive trade practice and if you end up getting sued, you could be liable for treble damages, that is triple damages. So to the extent that you are making, uh, making reservations for sign language interpreter and you have a choice of spending a little bit more to get the medical person, I would absolutely encourage you to do that as well. First of all, uh, the quality of interpretation is going to be better, but second of all, you're going to be in much better legal standing. Um, also, be prepared. I mean, we've talked a little bit today about uh, the process of getting an interpreter, sort of what some of the communication looks like. But I would absolutely encourage you guys, if, if possible, um, you know, maybe call up an interpreting, an interpreting agency and see if someone would be willing to come down to your office and chat with you for us. Um, perhaps try using a video remote interpreting um, computer or machine if you all are, are going the route of video remote interpreting. Oftentimes, I, I can't even stress how often this happens, we will get calls from deaf individuals who have gone to a medical establishment. It could be one of the biggest hospitals in Denver, in fact. And the staff does not know how to operate the video remote interpreting machine. Or the staff does not know how to contact a sign language interpreting agency. If you guys have run through that before and uh, perhaps gotten some of those hiccups out of the way, then that's just going to make communication smoother for everyone involved when it comes time to actually provide those communication supports. We need to pause for a second while the tape gets changed. Um, I wanted to touch on a couple of other things as well. Um, there's been some discussion about interpreters and confidentiality. Um, I, I am not an expert on HIPAA, but I can tell you this with absolute certainty. The courts um, absolutely view interpreters as not violating attorney-client privilege. So I can only imagine if attorney-client privilege, which is an extremely high bar, is not violated by the presence of an interpreter, then um, it wouldn't be a, a violation of HIPAA either. Um, in those cases, the courts have essentially found that a sign language interpreter is very much like an accountant, in fact. A lawyer is not expected to be able to look at a, an accounting sheet and figure anything out. That lawyer is allowed to hire, a, hire an accountant to look through that and translate it for the lawyer, essentially. And that's the, what a sign language interpreter is doing. A sign language interpreter is not adding anything to the communication, but simply clarifying the communication. So I don't believe that there would be any sort of uh, confidentiality issues with having an interpreter um, either live or remotely. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on is uh, video remote interpreting. We did have a question earlier about what video remote interpreting is. Generally, I describe it as Skyping with an interpreter. Um, the interpreter is going to be in a remote location looking into a video camera, and the interpreter will have a TV monitor or something. And the deaf or hard of hearing individual will have a similar setup. Oftentimes, it's a laptop computer. There are certain regulations from the Department of Justice about video remote interpreting, though. But those regulations are not met then the video remote interpreter um, is, is not effective. Uh, chief among those that I see violated is that the video remote interpreting machine has to have a dedicated connection. So that means you can't simply patch into the Wi-Fi of the hospital or your office. You have to have a dedicated connection, and I would encourage hardwire as well. Um, another thing that uh, the, the regulations require, and it's very commonsensical when you think about it, is that you can't use video remote interpreting if the deaf or hard of hearing individual is going to be in a body position where he or she can't actually view the screen or can't adequately view the screen. Mm -hmm. If there are multiple people in the room walking around or multiple people in the room using sign language, that video remote interpreter is not going to be able to 
No, that is the doctor who's off screen as opposed to the nurse who's off screen that's saying something. All that interpreter is going to know is that there's a voice coming from somewhere. Also, that deaf and hard of hearing individual needs to be able to sign back to the interpreter. So if someone's, say, laying on his or her side for a medical procedure, that person probably is going to have a lot harder of a time signing back and forth with an interpreter, even if you put that, that camera right in front of them. So, well, video remote interpreting is a great thing, and it opens up a lot of work for people. I would discourage its overuse, and you know, absolutely encourage that you guys get qualified sign language interpreters, especially if there's going to be any sort of uh, weird body positions, odd lighting, a lot of people, that sort of thing. One of the things that I've seen with the use of VRI is that it's actually being used in a way that's breaking HIPAA. Uh, sometimes the staff may not be aware of how loud the volume is or where they are actually using the, the system. And I've seen it in the past where it's being used in the lobby, and here is this person asking all of this confidential information, and the entire lobby can hear what's going on. And to me, I mean, I'm sure that, and the, and the deaf person's unaware of how loud it is. They're not sure that this is all going on, so they, they have no idea how to protect themselves in that situation. So there's a lot of things with using VRI that have to be taken into consideration as well. So um, I think that was it, sorry. Oops. Not saying it's bad, but um, I've had um, cases where um, if you're going to have VRI, the setup time and making sure the connection works um, at least 10 or 15 minutes before the appointment is so important. I've had, um, people that have waited like a half an hour after their appointment time just because, you know, it's technology. I was so worried before setting this up about just the microphones and we had to have a committee of five for these microphones, you know, so BRI is also technologically sometimes um, need some prep time. I'm sorry. I can, uh, I'm sorry, I've got one other thing to add about BRI. Um, yeah. With, uh, with Colorado having a, a statute that requires that sign language interpreters be certified, a lot of the BRI communications companies have gotten wise to this, and rather than calling their folks sign language interpreters or you know the words that appear in the statutes, they will call them communications specialists, something of that nature. If you're providing a, an uncertified BRI interpreter, then you are likely violating that law. So to the extent that you are going to be using BRI, ensure that it's a place that provides uh, provide certified interpreters as well. Uh, Patrick, I'm gonna ask you to chime in and then I have a, another question for uh, you and Candace. Mm -hmm. um, since the RI has been brought up, I just want to share my experience with the RI. Um, it just so happened at one point that um, I got into an office and I saw the VRI was set up, and I can hear a little bit. But what occurred was that uh, the door was open, and the VRI system was set up right there by the door, and there were other deaf people available who could actually nose in on the conversation that I was having, so I asked that the door be closed. And then the VRI system went down, and I said, you know what? hang on a second, we'll bring another computer. I go, you know what, no. I want to reschedule and bring in a live interpreter because um, in that clinic, um, they did not have an effective internet connection and I felt like it was critical I had a, a live interpreter. So, I mean, you know, and I also asked, you know, if we, they said, Joel, it'll take us 45 minutes. And I said, you know what, I don't care. If it takes five, 45 more minutes, still, our communication may be just fine. And so I was more than willing to accept the, the wait to have a live interpreter. So the question about best practices, I've been sort of writing a list over here as I've been observing what everybody's been saying and sharing, and so I, I have a note here I'd like to add. First of all, I wanted to say that when, when people within our community, within the deaf and hard of hearing community, and the deaf blind community too. That term hearing impaired is not a term that we use to identify ourselves. Hearing impaired is really not 
an appropriate uh, term to use. You know, you may see it in the newspaper, and you may hear it used out in the general community, in the public arena, but I would never call myself hearing impaired, ever, in a million years. So, um, you know, even a, a drunk person is impaired. I'm not impaired, <laughs> if you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> also, sometimes, uh, perhaps there's a last minute uh, family situation and you have to you know, get to a doctor's appointment quickly or whatever and you have a family member with you that comes to the appointment, but you have to really be cautious about using them as an interpreter. So the reason I want to tell you this is it's, it's a little bit of a bad joke. So there's a, a hearing, there's a deaf husband and a hearing wife, and the deaf husband says, I'm going to just have my wife interpret for me. So they go into the doctor's room, they sit down, and the man says, sorry, but you're going to die. The doctor tells them, sorry, you're going to die. And they look up at the doctor, and he says, why? What? Why? I want to live. What happened? What am I going to do? And the doctor says, well, if your wife keeps cooking and cleaning every day and keeps doing everything that she has to do, all the chores, every day, then you'll live. And the wife's interpreting. And the doctor looks at the husband and the wife. And the wife's signing away sharing her message. So what she says, you're going to likely die, period. <laughs> so if you can believe that. That's all she told her husband. So this is a good example of why it's imperative to hire a certified interpreter. That person doesn't have any bias involved with the situation. Also, sometimes with children, uh, they have they use interpreters, and ADA is very clear. It says that you're not allowed to utilize a deaf adult's child as an interpreter. In an emergency situation, <coughs> please still do not use the children as an interpreter. They don't understand the language that you're using. They are not able, they are family, so you have a little bit of a conflict involved there. It can be very embarrassing for the children and it can create some very serious issues down the road. Sometimes it may be tempting to assume that writing is going to be an effective way to communicate with someone that's deaf. However, I want to caution you in that regard as well. Deaf people really sign natively. That's their, their first language. That's how they communicate the most effective. So you're, you're still communicating with them in a second language when you use any kind of written communication and therefore can create some misunderstandings. So in regards to the medical field and, med and best practices, if an interpreter comes up for a situation, you can always ask that interpreter to see their RID certification card. Make sure that you use the term RID, Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf. And the reason you want to ask for that card and see that card is that it will show their certification. You may find that you're in a state where there's a state certification, in which case they may have a separate certification. But please understand that um, they may be also interpreting for kids in school, which is another type of certification, too. And, and an interpreter who does have the certification to work in a school district does not have the appropriate certification to work in a doctor's office or a medical setting. Another thing to consider if you have a policy and procedures that's written out for how you hire interpreters and when and how you use VRI, make sure that you have that, that written down somewhere where it's easy to get to, it's understood by all of your staff, it's clearly communicated. 
Make sure that everybody has the appropriate trainings that are needed about the policy and that, that you train repeatedly, not just one time, but to continue that training as time goes by. That way everybody has all of that training clearly, so if you hire someone new they know it, or if there's any kind of change in staffing they get that. You know how sometimes you don't remember everything that you get taught too, so it covers your, your basis in that regard as well. I have several handouts that I've put into your toolkit. This is one of them. It's the matrix of when to use VRI, Video Relay Interpreting. And what you'll see when you look at that is that there's many different uses for VRI. There's many different times where you can use VRI. For example, if you have a person that doesn't know sign language or um, is a minimal language user, VRI is absolutely not going to be appropriate for that. We talk at the commission about VRI as being as being a liability risk. If you're using VRI and the connection isn't a strong connection and you use, lose your connection during an assignment, that can really mess things up. If you have a live interpreter, that's not going to happen. It's easy to have that live interpreter there to just cover your bases and your ADA is covered. I just want to warn you that um, VRI has not been reliable from the experiences of many people in the past. Um, I've been to a VRI situation, it was a medical setting, and, oh, sorry. And one time, so I went to a medical appointment and they had VRI set up. It seemed like it was going to be working fine, it was running smoothly, everything was going well. However, where they had stationed the screen was difficult for me to see because I was trying to look at the doctor who was in one direction and the screen for the VRI that was in another direction. So I asked them, would it be okay if you moved this computer screen so that I could see the doctor and the screen in, the, in my same visual space? And as soon as we did that, the connection was, was lost. So sometimes it works. Sometimes it's awesome, and other times it's not so awesome. So I'm sorry, I didn't mean to dominate that, but I just wanted to add those comments. Actually, I have another question that I'd like you and Patrick, and then um, actually Jenny and Sarah to all weigh in on. One of the things that we hear a lot is that people um, say, well, the deaf person came in and, and they can lip read. And so we just sit and talk and lip read. And that works just fine. And maybe we'll pass notes sometimes, and that's just fine. Um, I'd like to hear your responses to that. Um, so I don't know, do you want to go first, or Patrick, or? Uh, sure. All right, um, yes, I'd be glad to do so. In terms of that issue, I've certainly had that experience. Absolutely. To be honest with you, it happens to me a lot. Because first of all, I can't talk. I do have pretty good lip reading skills, I really do. So I might come in and do the show, you know, I'll, I'll immediately say, you know what, I'm not understanding. Time out here for a second because, you know, then they'll have the doctor come in and they talk really fast and I go, you know what, you have to stop. You're talking way too fast for me to follow. So, and that's the issue around speech reading. So I've tried and relied on getting an interpreter more often, simply because, truthfully, speech reading and talking doesn't really help. Uh, they say that 25 to 40% actually is um, readable on the list, but the rest of it not. And you know, I've gone through surgery 
and I was unable to understand, you know, unless I had an interpreter present, right? So regardless of my abilities, it's best not to rely on that. So as a hard of hearing person, um, I do have some hearing, so I can hear some things. Um, but I do, um, I do what they call face-to-face -face communication. So I like to really have a clear view, have someone standing right in front of me. If there's a beard or a mustache, it can really interfere with my ability to communicate. And I rely on body language as well. So um, I, I watch someone's facial expression. I, I know the topic of the conversation, which is helpful. And I don't know if you guys have seen, um, there's a bad lip reading YouTube video out there about the football, if some of you are nodding. Yeah, it's, that's like my life story. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I mean every day, I, I, I've used it to help me actually, to, to kind of keep the humor if you will, but there's so many times where I misunderstand things and it can be very funny. So if you were watching what I was just doing, could you tell what I was saying? One response was, am I, are you saying all of you? What am I saying? I love you. No? No? I do love you, though. I do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. No, I'm saying island view. Island view. Yeah. So obviously lip reading, you know, is very easily misunderstood. So that's all I wanted to share. Thank you. Um, Jenny and Sarah, I'd like you to chime in on this as, as people who are hearing but who work a lot with the deaf community. One thing I um, think is important is just to give options. And so it's important for your front um, line staff to give those options. So, you know, if someone's in an emergency situation and if they had one choice and they have to come in, you know, and the choice is a tuna fish sandwich, okay, well, I'm, I'm gonna go in for emergency sur surgery, I'll accept that tuna fish sandwich. But if they had a choice between that and steak or, you know, ice cream, giving those options of an interpreter or BRI or CART, that's a, the most important for communication. Um, one thing I wanted to add that hasn't, oh, um, two things I wanted to add that hasn't been necessarily discussed is um, when you talk to the deaf person, um, most times these days um, they're gonna be using, uh, they're gonna be using a video phone and it's gonna be going through a video relay service. There's um, national call centers all over the country um, that are funded by the FCC when you guys get a phone bill, that part of your tax dollars is for that, where they're gonna be talking through a sign language interpreter. Um, TTY is uh, an older technology that mostly is now used for people that are, have speech disabilities or some people that um, just don't wanna get with the times and you know use video, but that's their choice too, but uh, just to let you know, they're gonna be talking through a sign language interpreter. But then also for the uh, appointment itself, um, it's important to talk directly to the deaf person. So um, don't talk to the interpreter, to have the interpreter say, can you tell him or can you tell her? Just say, hey, you know, I wanna see where you're hurting, where are you hurting, and talking directly to the deaf person. So that's what I want to add. Okay, so going back to if the reading is appropriate, um, again, giving the options. If I can ask you guys to imagine, you know, have you all experienced something where you're in a situation and whoever's teaching you something is not teaching you in the way that you're used to, whether it's auditory, visual, kinesthetic, it's not what you're good at. So imagine being in a doctor's appointment and you're trying to figure out how to understand the information that's given to you. And not only is it not necessarily in the way that you're able to learn, but it's also not necessarily in that language. So to, to me, that's kind of the same situation as lip reading, but way more so, like lip reading is way, way worse. Um, so there are, there are people like Candace was saying that you know, they were 
forced to be mainstreamed or forced to possibly go to, they, they used to have residential schools, and maybe they still do, that focus only on oral uh, instruction, and sign language is not allowed. And so those students may or may not be effective in that education. So if you have someone that isn't effective in that communication, and learn how to read, maybe they can't. Some can, I have seen some people very successful with it, but some can't. And if they're being dependent on that skill and they don't have it, then the communication for them is just not there at all. So again, it just really depends on the individual and what their skills are. Also, oftentimes people go to medical appointments because they're in pain and they're under stress and so um, having the best communication possible is a relief when you're under pain or in stress. And if I can just put a, a bit of legal veneer on this citizen as well. Um, when you're talking about lip reading and writing, one thing that's important to remember is that the regulations require that communication be effective both expressively and receptively. So just because the individual may understand the person writing their name and date of birth, things like that on a piece of paper, does not mean that the deaf individual is going to be able to understand all of the other communication coming into him or her, or frankly, that that person is going to be able to communicate everything he or she wants to say to the uh, medical professional. One other thing that's very common in the deaf community is nodding. Simply because a deaf person is nodding when you're attempting to communicate with them does not indicate understanding. It may simply be that that person is attempting to recognize that you are trying to communicate with them. So please don't uh, misunderstand nodding to be an indication of understanding or an answer of being inside there. Great. So we have time for each of you to go through, to go, um, to, to share. If, is there anything that didn't get said that you think needs to be said? And, and if not, do you have one, one piece of advice for people that want to do a good job. Um, and after this panel, we'll take a short, we'll take a short break, maybe do a door prize. And then we're going to come back and we're going to explain what is in these packets and how to use them because they are tools that will help you be able to, to, to follow the law and do things, do things in a way that works well and also a pilot program that we're starting to, to see if we can help ease the communication. So if we can just start with you, Andrew, and we'll go down the line. Um, I, I guess just to kind of conclude, I would, I would reiterate uh, the point I made at the very beginning. Under the law, your obligation is to provide effective communication. Well, that is a fairly nebulous concept, there are definite steps to follow. The first is to provide auxiliary aids and services. That could be a sign language interpreter, writing notes, etc. But talk with the person to figure out what he or she may want. There are, uh, there are some further guidelines in determining which auxiliary aid or service you should provide, and uh, that's going to be on one of the handouts that we prepared also. But those are things like the nature, uh, length, and complexity of the communication. Um, you also need to keep an, an eye on um, privacy and independence of the deaf or hard of hearing individual, the complexity, the method of the communication. Um, looking at all those things, I can tell you, in my experience also, I've never encountered a deaf or hard hearing person who says that they prefer VRI over a live interpreter. So the easy answer would probably be get a live interpreter um, in most circumstances. But if not, your obligation is still to provide effective communication, whether that be through an interpreter, um, live or video, or some other means. I am available for any questions, and our agency, Connections for Independent Living, is offering everyone that registered with us today a 10% discount for three months. So if you guys are in need of our services, uh, please feel free to contact us. Again, there are several agencies out there. Um, just because I'm on this panel doesn't mean I feel like you have to call us. So um, please find out what you guys are needing that's going to be best for your office. And um, of course, we're all available. So thank you. After this, um, is over, we're going to be having some time for questions and answers, but if you don't feel like you want to um, stand up and ask a question, um, go ahead and there's some notebook paper. You can um, give your question to Roy, who has the light blue shirt, and then um, the panel can answer it. Also, um, in the back, we're, after the panel is over, we're, we'll have a um, 
deaf panelists available if you want to ask a, a question that you don't want to ask the whole panel. And um, I am very excited after the panel is over to uh, enjoy Zetta Marie's Patisserie's cookies. She's a deaf baker in Loveland. And um, so that's what I wanted to say. So thank you. Um, so I think. I, I, did, I was just thinking of one more thing while everyone was talking up here, and um, another thing I thought of is just the advantage of having the live interpretive service um, present for the dental appointment. Since the majority of the procedures we're doing, you know, the um, patients under local anesthetic and they're awake, it's really nice to have someone in the room with you where if that patient is feeling something during the procedure, um, you know, it's easier to sit them up and have that communication really effectively, having all three team members there. Um, and I really like what you said about, you know, you almost feel like you're a part of the care team, and I think that's really a really neat thing, so. Um, the one thing that I was thinking of is that if you or anyone you know needs any kind of services in the dental field, it doesn't happen very often, but please let me know. Um, my team and I are more than ready, willing, and able to give a hand with that. Well, this is a great panel and a lot of good information being shared today. Um, and I really appreciated the opportunity to um, participate in this panel and was asked to speak a little bit about care coordination. And maybe I can go into a little bit more detail about that. Um, care coordination is an, an added benefit for those who receive Medicaid. Um, there is no cost for the service, um, and it just takes a minute to enroll, um, so we would encourage everybody to do that. And the goal of care coordination is to make sure that everybody is working together for your best interest. All the different service providers, um, we want services coordinated so that you're able to, to best reach your health and wellness goals. Um, care coordinators can do a variety of things. Um, we're very flexible and very resourceful, but I did prepare a list of some of the services that we have offered. Um, we can help individuals find a new doctor who accepts Medicaid. We can help you arrange transportation to a medical or therapy appointment. We can help you cope with and learn about any illnesses that you've been diagnosed with. We can help you understand your insurance benefits or do our very best with that. Um, we can also help you find specialists, whether that's um, dentists, vision care providers, mental health or substance abuse treatment services. And care coordinators can act as a liaison between you and your doctors. Um, we also can attend doctor's appointments with our members if that's something that you would like. And again, it's sometimes nice just to have another set of eyes and ears um, because those communications are so important and we want to make sure that that's clear. Um, we can help you file a grievance or an appeal about a a level of care that you have received at a doctor's office or at a hospital. We can help you access um, skilled and unskilled uh, in-home health care services. Um, we can help you uh, get durable medical equipment that you need, may need, like say a walker or a shower bench. Um, and we make lots of referrals for other community programs, whether that's housing, food stamps, um, we have a very uh, knowledgeable group of individuals that, that work on the team. Um, and my coworker, Kayla Wagner, is back there, and she's um, just a wealth of information and resources. Um, so again, I'd encourage uh, anybody who has Medicaid to get enrolled in the ACC. And we have um, several different brochures and flyers back there. Um, on our table, and we hope that you come back and visit with us and say hi, and um, if you have any specific questions, we're happy to answer those. Um, so thank you for being here today, and uh, thanks for your time.
So two more things that I just thought of, wanted to add. Someone had mentioned briefly about hearing aids, and I remembered that I had included this form in your kit as well. And it's for CCDHH in regards to hearing aids. I know many, many people out there need hearing aids. And insurance companies don't typically cover hearing aids. And Medicaid typically does not cover hearing aids as well. So if you have children, um, there is a state law that provides hearing aids for children. However, when they become an adult, then it's no longer provided to them. It's up to them to pay for those. Some hearing aids cost anywhere from up to $4,000 each, just for one. And they're super expensive, and that's really hard for someone to have to um, provide for themselves to come up with that kind of money. So this form talks a little bit about um, some different resources. We did develop a task force. And we're trying now to set up, this task force is trying now to set up the best practices and standards when working with the deaf and hard of hearing to provide uh, hearing aids and equipment. There, within the law, it does talk about durable medical equipment. And hearing aids fall under that category. So it's, you know, I just want people to have options. Oh, sorry, it means that they are optional, the hearing aids. They're actually considered cosmetic. Yeah. So my advice is continue to talk with your deaf and hard of hearing patients within the community. You know, if you develop any kind of new policies and procedures, you know, feel free to include the deaf community in on those discussions and educating them about that. Ask, ask the deaf community for their opinion. Ask them if they prefer a live interpreter or VRI. Um, find out about new technology within the deaf community. They know all kinds of information about new technology. Get their feedback. You know, when you provide them with an interpreter, feel free to ask them, was that interpreter adequate for you? Did that work well for you? Make sure to continue to update your policies and procedures and continue to train all your staff, especially people who are at the front desk. They're really in the front line. Thank you. As a provider, um, I just appreciate the fact that there's a, a panel to talk about this. I appreciate that uh, we've used interpretive services. I've met you before. <laughs> um, so I just, uh, I just appreciate that. I appreciate that this is here. And I thank you for your advice. And thank you. Thank you. I also want to thank you for coming as well. But I also want to tell you that, you know, I worked in the medical field in the past. And so I work kind of in opposite roles now, but I used to be sitting in your chair. And hearing people were my patients. I was a vet tech. And so I always had an interpreter with me at all times. And I had a team of five interpreters that I relied on at that time, you know, that were possibly in the room and hearing people were like, wow, why is this person here? And I said, you know what? My interpreter is working for you more than they're working for me. It actually was a very good experience for uh, me, but also for them as well. Uh, that interpreter worked with me you know, at all times, but and, and at that time I had had students as well, but I'm not working there any longer. But it was just a really good experience to be on the other side of the table. But take advantage of everything you've learned today because it will really improve your services and provide better services for your uh, clients and patients as well. Thank you. Can everyone give this amazing panel a hand? Hi, my name is Dr. Lee Thrupp.
I'm a dentist with the Northern Larimer County Health District. I was, came here today um, to advocate for interpretive services and to let people know that we offer them um, and have good relationships with patients. Thank you. My name is Chris Hemby. I work for the Health District of Northern Larimer County Family Dental Clinic. I am the front office supervisor and we were invited on the panel because we actually use deaf interpretation services at our clinic for some of our patients. My name is Dr. Lennox. I'm a dentist with the Health District of Northern Larimer County. Uh, my uh, clinic director asked me to be here today. Um, so I really wanted to come um, just learn a little bit more about the interpretation services that um, are offered here in Fort Collins and just learn more um, about the deaf community. Um, there is a lot of great information today and I really appreciate um, you guys letting me be here. Hi, I'm Sarah Burnett. I am the ASL Interpreter Coordinator for Connections for Independent Living. I am on the board and committee for the town hall meeting uh, for Rocky Mountain Health Plans and I'm here just to help communication happen. I'm Andrew Montoya. I'm an attorney with the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition and I was asked to come here today to address some of the legal requirements under the ADA, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, and some of the other laws that touch on access for individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing. My name is Patrick, and I work at Home Depot, uh, the graveyard shift. And the reason why I'm on this panel is because I have experience in the medical field previously, and I was part of the board uh, of this group that hosted. And the reason why I'm here is to really help improve communication for deaf um, and medical staff to bridge that gap and to help things be more effective in the future. And so that's what we're looking at continuing on. Uh, my name is Julie Riskin. That's R-E-I-S-K-I-N. It doesn't sound, spell like it sounds. Anyway, I'm the director of the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition, a statewide civil rights organization. And uh, Rocky Mountain Health Plans uh, contracted with us to help them with client engagement. And that's how I am involved with the Bridging Communications Group. And so I've been facilitating and helping them plan this event and their work and advice to Rocky. And I think that's how I came to moderate this panel. There, my name is Candace Adair, and my sign name is this. And I work for the Colorado Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, CCDHH. <clears throat> and I was invited uh, by Julie from CCDC, that's a Colorado Cross Disability uh, Coalition. And she had invited me to come. To the panel, she asked me to present on deaf and hard of hearing, the deaf and hard of hearing's perspective, and I identify as hard of hearing myself. And I do outreach and consultation for deaf and hard of hearing people. And I'm also an ADA um, expert. Hi, my name is Jenny Miller, and I'm the specialist for the deaf and hard of hearing at Disabled Resource Services. We're one of nine independent living centers um, serving Colorado. My specific center, uh, Disabled Resource Services, serves all of Larimer and Jackson counties. Um, Julie Riskin originally asked um, us to ask our consumers um, to uh, be a part of a, a group, and um, we had the most people that came as a part of this group to talk about issues for accessible medical treatment were our, the deaf community, so that's how I've been a part of the group. Thank you.